Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the September CEO Power Hour. A um, little bit later than normal to uh, stop our friends in the US having to get up in the middle of the night and join us. Um, I almost forgot about it because I, I knew it was lunchtime today and I thought, right, OK, let's get this done. And then I thought, oh, gosh, I've got another two hours. And then I had to set my alarm to remember because it's yeah. we've been doing this now for almost as long as the pandemic's been going on, which seems like, oh, I don't know, about 10 years. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Uh, today's speakers, um, and we've got four of them, are the good gentlemen from the Associated Equipment Distributors who are the trade association in the well, the whole of North America, not just the States, States, Canada and Mexico. Um, and they're going to tell us a lot more about something that I got asked a lot when I was in Conexpo last year, which was, OK, we're in the States. We know there's a demand for our products, but how do we get the product to market? Who's our local representation? What should we be doing? How do we find the right people? How do we service them? So we're going to learn a lot more about that today. And I think it's it's the start of a really good relationship with AED. Um, I've taken a couple of, of uh, UK groups out to the AED's conference in the past, which they combined with an exhibition. And uh, we were just talking about a great time we had in San Diego. Um, so really recommend them. We know them. Um, I should have just introduced myself, really. I think everybody knows me, um, Joanna Oliver. Uh, in normal times, I look after the international program for the Construction Equipment Association. Uh, last time I actually went international was Conexpo last year, but hoping to put that right. Who knows, maybe going to Orlando to the AED conference in January would be a good start. Quick run through the rules of the CEA house. Webinars held in accordance with the CEA corporate compliance rules, a copy of which is on our website. Webinar is being recorded, uh, will be available on the CEA website. You will get a copy of it if you've attended this meeting together with the slides from the speakers. Please stay on mute. Um, um, we do encourage lots of questions from the participants. If you've got anything, write it in the chat box and I will shout it out if it's relevant uh, during the actual presentations or we'll ask questions later to the uh, speakers as a whole. Some of you I know are still working from home, so please turn off your video to conserve bandwidth. And finally, uh, please don't complain if you or we have any technical difficulties. <laughs> We're doing our best. <laughs> this is very British, look. We have to apologise in advance if anything going wrong. They're all laughing. <laughs> but you shouldn't laugh because our television mask burnt down um, and there's, there's nearly a million people without television near where I live. So um, we, we like to apologise a lot being British. Um, as we were saying earlier, you've got our Prime Minister. So um, anyway, moving swiftly on. Our speakers today are all from uh, AED, and I'm going to uh, hand over to John Crothers, the Vice President, and I've, I've been working with John for a little bit on this, and John's going to uh, introduce both AED and he'll go through who, who all the speakers are. Um, so let me stop sharing my screen, and John, over to you. Thank you, Joanna. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to uh, speak with your uh, organization members uh, and uh, get started. I just wanted to introduce uh, the AED team here that will be uh, yeah, joining me here today. Uh, first off, uh, Brian McGuire, our president and CEO, uh, who's joining me here in our office in Chicago, as well as Bob Henderson, our COO and executive vice president. And then joining remotely from our DC office is Daniel Fisher, our Senior Vice President of Government Affairs and Communications. Um, so I'll be your primary, uh, lead you through some of the information I'll share today and they will uh, uh, obviously have their, their comments along the way as well um, as we go through the, the information. But first I'll kind of turn it over to Brian to give you a little bit of just a high level overview and introduction regarding AED. Sure, thank you, John. So as it's been uh, stated, uh, AED or the Associated Equipment Distributors uh, is the, uh, 
trade association for both the distributors uh, and the uh, manufacturers of off-road uh, construction, mining, uh, forestry, agriculture, power gen, uh, you name it. If it, if it moves earth uh, or is involved in building infrastructure in any way, uh, that equipment is represented by AED members. Uh, we have over uh, 450 distributor members representing over 5,200 locations across North America. And, and that's uh, on top of uh, 200 manufacturing members. Uh, one of the key jobs of the association is connecting those distributors with uh, manufacturers who are looking for ch channels to bring their product to market. AED members also represent the most successful uh, of the distributors in the business. Uh, and that is in part because of their activity with the association, uh, which involves attending conferences, uh, taking advantage of training opportunities for their staffs, uh, attending networking events, uh, as well as uh, working with the association on our public policy agenda with uh, advocacy occurring both in Washington, D.C. and in Ottawa, Canada, all uh, supporting free trade and making sure that public policy is adopted that uh, fosters growth in this industry and also uh, maintains our workforce in this industry. Thank you, Brian. Um, so as Brian said, yeah, we, we have a very robust uh, membership of manufacturers and distributors involved in uh, generally heavy equipment across the board. So uh, we cover a wide variety of, of industries. Um, and what we kind of position here today is to kind of get in a little bit about the North America market, particularly in the construction side uh, that we deal with the most. And uh, also give you a little bit of feel for what a distributor looks like in the United States and Canada, how to interact with them, what their expectations are, um, and how to best engage with them uh, working with, uh, with us uh, in the United States and Canada. Uh, so really, from a construction market standpoint, uh, just to give everyone kind of a sense of what's going on here in uh, the North American market in general, um, you know, we're, we, uh, in general, the infrastructure side of things is trending up. Um, it's kind of been characterized in the press regarding growth, sustainability, and resilience. Uh, Mr. Fisher, I'm sure, will share a little bit more information in, in a minute regarding our pending legislation on infrastructure spending, which has been uh, in the press quite a bit lately uh, and is moving toward a, a decision here uh, very quickly. Uh, housing starts, uh, to no great surprise, has been trending up for the past year, uh, primarily due to people moving out of the city centers, uh, expedited by, uh, by COVID. Uh, in the, uh, particularly in the U.S., we have historically low mortgage rates of below 3%, uh, encouraging a lot of the millennials to uh, move out from the renting situations in large cities and establish homes in the, the suburbs of major cities. Uh, and that has also led into a lot of the digitization, digitization of work uh, with uh, people moving out and being able to work, work remotely, again, expedited through, uh, through COVID. Um, on the non-residential side, we're, uh, we kind of see a trending down uh, due to the kind of transformation of retail. Uh, retail centers in North America are starting to kind of go through a transition. The large malls and big box stores are not as prevalent. Uh, people moving a lot more to online shopping. Uh, and also people trending down uh, to work from remote work. So the commercial uh, office space, space uh, area has also started to trend down as well. And then uh, lastly, energy sector is kind of the other area we look at uh, relatively flat still. Um, I guess in general, we're looking at um, current administration not as favorable to uh, fossil fuels type things, uh, moving to kind of new markets and new business models, uh, but nothing specific enough come out other than cancellation of a rather significant pipeline that can, was planned. Can I, sorry, can I just between US and Canada. interrupt? Yes. Um, I'm not seeing the slides moving on. Okay, sorry about that. Let me, uh... I was just thinking it was quite a long introduction. Maybe you want to stop and start again. Ah, there we go. Are we updated now? 
I've got slide six of 27. There you go. Let me go back one slide here. Cool. Do you have that? Yep. Okay. Any questions on the market sectors, uh, uh, Joanna? Um, no. Um, interesting that you've got um, the power gen as well, because we, we look after that sector as well as um, as the construction equipment sector. So even more opportunities. Honestly, um, with prices going back up, uh, there is a, and as John mentioned, with, with the oil companies uh, looking to maybe uh, getting uh, uh, less involved in fossil fuel, uh, there is a concern now on natural gas. You, uh, Joanna was talking about canceling Christmas earlier uh, with some Brexit issues. Uh, we may have to cancel Christmas uh, because everybody's going to be colder or put on another sweater uh, because uh, natural gas prices are going up. And now there are worries about supply. So it's always something, either up or down, which is uh, uh, seems to be the nature of the energy sector. Okay. And then on the market impact side, um, there's been a continued short shortage of uh, essential workers, which isn't uh, really... Uh, a new thing, um, uh, but we have been able to deem, uh, during the COVID period, we were able to get the construction industry uh, identified as essential workers, which helped tremendously in the distribution and manufacturing side here in the United States. Um, and then the uh, other market impact is, uh, at least initially when uh, the new uh, administration was coming in, uh, indicated a, a clear focus on infrastructure spending, which has then led into some of the legislation that is now pending, and uh, I think it's probably an opportune time to uh, turn it over to Mr. Fisher, and you can talk a little bit about what we do on the government affairs side, and, and talk a little bit more about what's going on as of late in Washington, D.C. Sure. Uh, thanks, John, and thank you, everyone, for having me. Greetings from our nation's capital on this dreary, very London-like day here. Um, so as mentioned, uh, AED has a pretty comprehensive government affairs program. We have an office in D.C. as well as an office in Ottawa, um, one of our primary activities is direct lobbying of legislative and executive branch officials and um, facilitating access to policymakers. Um, coordinating with OEM and allied organizations, nothing in DC gets done with just one organization alone. So we work very closely with OEMs as well as customer organizations, such as general contractor groups, utility contractors, um, Stone, uh, aggregate industry, aggregate industry, all pushing for um, common legislative and policy goals. We host a Washington fly-in, which is coming up actually October 25th, where we bring members, our AAD members, both dealers and manufacturers, into Washington to get up to speed on policy issues, and then they actually go and lobby um, their members of Congress themselves. Uh, we put out a DC debrief and an Ottawa policy brief, monthly newsletters to update our members on what's happening in uh, both capitals. And um, we run a political action committee, which I think I don't, I'm, I'm fairly certain you don't have that in, uh, in uh, Britain or in England, but um, that is a, a uh, fund that we help use, that we use to help support uh, political candidates and um, lawmakers who are, agree with us on our issues, so. Next yeah, slide. We have to be apolitical as a, an association. We do have members of parliament and lords and, and senior civil servants, but we have to uh, not be seen to favour one political party or another. And, and we try our best not to be uh, seen as favouring one political party or another. Um, we do. Uh, we are a bipartisan organisation in, um, in that re in the, on the political front. So infrastructure funding, and this kind of gets into, I think, what we're going to see here on um, as far as the market uh, for equipment in the future. Um, AED, we advocate for long-term certainty and increased investments in federal infrastructure programs, all types of infrastructure listed there. Um, anything that really builds, whether it's roads, uh, could be hospitals, um, schools, all obviously requires um, equipment that our members are selling and manufacturing. Um, and I'm really, I, I think the, you know, I, John talked a little bit about the market right now. And I think um, I'm optimistic that we will have a, about a trillion dollar infrastructure bill across the finish line here um, pretty soon, um, which can only make the uh, market in the US for equipment stronger. So 
And that bill is $1 trillion of investments in roads, bridges, broadband, water systems, ports, airports. Um, I'm sure I'm missing a, a bunch of other import, um, waterways. So it's a massive, um, a massive bill that will um, that will be good and create a lot of market opportunity for for equipment. As Brian mentioned, AD is um, unabashedly a pro free trade organization. We um, advocate for free trade agreements, tariff repeals, and trade normal normalization, particularly with our allies. Um, we've um, as far as a couple of years ago, we were one of the leading organizations supporting the USMCA agreement um, that replaced NAFTA. And I think I was reading that, I think the um, President Biden and Prime Minister Johnson's meeting yesterday, all indications went very well. And it sounds like there's some talks on um, some good trade um, normalization with, um, with the United Kingdom. Um, and also I read that UK, the UK might actually be looking to join the USMCA agreement, which will further kind of, um, you know, create better trade opportunities for all of North America with the United Kingdom. Um, there's this was uh, there was uh, there is optimism that trade relations will um, improve uh, with our allies, particularly under um, President Biden. Um, I don't I, 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 that was a couple months ago. There's been some other international affairs issues that um, may have um, not been helpful on the trade side. That um, but. We're still optimistic that as things are opening up and the president begins to meet with more international leaders, that um, trade relations will improve, particularly as it um, relative to the Trump administration. Um, and then, you know, one of the threats out there that we're really monitoring. So good stuff on infrastructure funding, hopefully international trade, but it's um, on regulatory mandates. Um, we anticipate a challenging regulatory environment when it comes to energy and natural resource development and labor and environmental regulations as the administration now they've been in power, the Biden administration has been in power for I guess about nine months now. Um, so they're just really starting to get um, to issue regulations and to uh, uh, put mandates on various sectors. Um, and so we do anticipate um, a challenging regulatory environment, but I think that with the way the economy is going right now and with, you know, hopefully, as I said, a big infrastructure package that should um, I think outweigh a lot of the negatives that will come um, with greater re regulation. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. okay. Hearing none, if any come in, Joanna, feel free to jump in and uh, uh, ask yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just going to say, um, happy, Daniel, happy to put you in touch with our senior technical consultant who handles. Um, all the regulatory issues um, and obviously we were trying to after Brexit we were supposed to be getting our own UK uh, CA mark to replace the CE marking um, that's been put back a year uh, on the grounds of the fact they realized they didn't have anybody to do the inspections for the CA marking um, and a number of other things but it, as we move hopefully towards uh, some sort of trade deal and looking at the lunchtime news today, it looks more like an application to join the USMCA than a, a bespoke UK-US trade deal. That, that might be quite interesting for you, know, for you and Dale to, to maybe talk. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to uh, be put in touch. Yeah, but I'll do you an introduction. Thank you. Great. That Thank sounds you. great. Actually, John, I, I, I know I said I was. Oh, yeah, there, Dale. I yeah, thought yeah. you were on something else. Yeah, the other meeting yeah. finished early. It was a Brexit, another Brexit meeting, but it finished early, so I was able to join. So I was listening to you, Daniel, with uh, with great interest. So yeah, I'll drop my email in the uh, in the chat, and uh, yeah, perhaps we can communicate afterwards. Perfect. Look forward to meeting you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Um, moving on, we're just going to give a little bit idea of what a distributor looks like in North America. Um, if you haven't really had a lot of involvement with distributors. Here, we're gonna to try to get a little bit of an idea of what they kind of look like and what the uh, uh, conditions look like today. Um, really the high level macro story of distributors as of uh, right now, uh, distributors in general are financially uh, stability, sustainability is quite strong. Um, we, we do a report, which we'll talk about in a little bit, which kind of brings in a lot of the dealer operational numbers to AED. So we get a sense of how strong the dealer networks are they uh the balance sheet is uh trending up 
from 2019 into 2020 numbers based on what we've received at this point. So we've kind of got everyone's financial information from 2020. Uh, so everything actually fared quite well uh, during 2020 uh, and very strong. Uh, revenue was flat, and uh, but was mix has a mix. The mix of the revenue has stab stabilized compared compared to previous years. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. And then uh, rentals continues to be uh, a focus for uh, heavy equipment distributors, a growing focus as it has been for uh, almost 10 years now. Uh, and they're getting more and more integrated, uh, uh, reintegrating the rental portions of their business into their standard business models uh, through their processes, through their tools, uh, through their equipment fleets that they're, they're maintaining. Um, Bob, Brian, do you have anything else to add in that area? No, I think you're right on. Yeah. Sure. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea, these are the numbers out from our cost doing business study, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Just kind of gives you a little bit of sense of what's going on with equipment distributors in the North American market. New and used equipment rentals has been trending down since 2012 overall. Still a huge piece of their business, though. Um, it did tick up in 2020. Uh, comparatively, which you can see went up to over half of the business again. But in general, it's anywhere between 50% to 60% of an average distributor's business. It does vary quite a bit, uh, which we'll see in a little bit. Uh, the areas of parts, service, and rental are kind of collectively have uh, kind of uh, been relatively stable and with probably rental trending upwards uh, over the past years. Uh, so that's kind of what we're seeing. We monitor this pretty regularly to look for stability and changes in the revenue mix um, across the distributors. Um, talking about the distributors in general, uh, as we mentioned earlier on, we've got about 450 or so heavy equipment distributors, and that's based on headquarter locations is how we, uh, we have our membership structure uh, across North America. You can see how they're geographically distributed. In general, distributors to the Western United States and Canada tend to have more locations. Uh, but there are fewer entities, uh, corporate entities alone. East Coast, Central United States, a little bit more, fewer locations, uh, more smaller territories uh, across those areas as well. If we roll in the branches, you can see those branches populate in uh, as well. You can see how they're located across uh, the U.S. So you can see the West Coast is very heavily dominated along the coast itself uh, with you know, Central and Eastern United States quite heavily dominated with branches, usually within a short distance to the point of use by the contractor. So uh, distributors will try to put the branches in a location uh, ideal uh, to service the customers quickly. Um, in the construction market specifically, that, that uh, diameter of where they would cover is quite large uh, compared to maybe agriculture, which we see is a little bit smaller, many more branch locations closer to the point of use on the agriculture market. Um, when people ask like, what does a distributor look like in the United States? Um, it's, it's really a wide variety of distributors exist in the US and Canada. Um, so it's really not a one size fits all situation. AED's membership in general comprises a wide variety of sizes of organizations, as you can see on this uh, particular chart where you have uh, you know, a lot of distributors, quarter of the distributors are still considered under $5 million a year in business. Uh, they're probably uh, more focused on niche specialty products and smaller markets. Um, a vast majority of the dealers, if you look at 75% or so of the distributors in the marketplace by number um, are 75 million, uh, 150 million and under. Uh, there are quite a few uh, large distributors, but in total number of the 450 that we represent uh, that are over 500 million uh, is relatively small. So you get a wide variety. And really what that means is if you're coming to the, in the marketplace uh, looking to engage, you have a, uh, quite a bit of uh, dealer variety to, to choose from to find what fits best for your products, your business, and your markets that you're trying to serve. Uh, Location-wise, again, uh, as you saw with the, the map, um, to give you a little idea how we break down the United States, about 10% of our members uh, are in the, in the Canadian market, uh, and that reflects a pretty high percentage of the Canadian distributor market overall. 
Uh, U.S., there are significantly more distributors of heavy equipment. Uh, right now, 90% of our membership is reflected in the United States. And you can see how they're, they're geographically dispersed uh, throughout the, the country with the, uh, the states listed there. We do have a small international presence as well of anybody outside the U.S. and Canada. Uh, but again, depending on where your products, what your products are, uh, the types of markets they serve, um, pretty good, good variety of dealers that you could engage with uh, throughout the marketplace. So if it's, uh, you're more in the forestry market, uh, definitely looking at areas in the Northeast and, and West, uh, a good, good membership uh, potential in those areas as well. The demographics, uh, really the, the trends we've been seeing here in demographics, uh, the total revenue, which we track uh, or total revenue of, of products sold uh, by our distributor members, average and median have all been trending upwards over the past uh, four or five years. Uh, that has continued to, uh, we haven't seen really a whole lot of change in that. Um, number of locations and average number of locations have been trending up. And that's really primarily being driven by acquisitions. Uh, it's still a marketplace where um, distributor acquisitions are, are pretty common. Uh, we've had several of our members uh, be acquired by other members. Uh, we've had some non-members acquire companies, uh, but we'll continue to see that uh, probably for the foreseeable future with continued acquisitions. Um, total number of employees in general, from what we can tell, those numbers have relatively stayed flat, uh, primarily due to workforce shortages. Um, it doesn't take uh, very long to look at our press, our news information in the, in the North American market uh, with the skilled worker shortage that we're facing, which I believe might be the same situation in the UK, uh, something that AED works on actively through our AED Foundation uh, to try to get more people coming into this marketplace uh, to try, because the demand is definitely there. Any comments? Um, so networking in the industry. So how do you find distributors in North America? Um, in, in many cases, uh, the best places to do this, uh, we obviously feel are through some of our networking conferences. The difference is with us compared to other events that take place in the marketplace, like Joanna mentioned, uh, Con Expo, uh, which is more of an end user focus show. Our conferences are really focused. The dealers are the attendees. So they are coming there to learn, meet with people, network, uh, grow their, find opportunities to grow their business. They are the, the, the primary attendee. We don't have the end users, the contractors uh, at our events. Um, a majority of our events are listed here. Uh, some of them are smaller topical focused events, such as our finance symposium, which is 100 or so finance and HR related people uh, from dealership organizations. One coming up very soon is our Washington fly-in event that will be in October. Um, so all that, the, the things that Daniel mentioned about uh, what's happening in DC, um, if you happen to be located in the United States or uh, can uh, get to the US uh, by October um, with the travel restrictions that may be in place, um, that is a fantastic event to really get plugged into what's going on from a legislative side uh, with, uh, with our industry. Uh, other conferences are really geared at improving dealership operations, the emerging leaders. Uh, we have an event focused on smaller dealers, which is a great opportunity to meet and engage with dealer principals from what we consider smaller dealers, which are typically five and under multi-line dealers. Um, Executive Conclave is an event we've, we've held that is more geared at the larger dealers, more of a C-suite audience. And then lastly, but uh, probably the most important event to consider and to think about for networking is AED Summit uh, and a little bit more on that. So Summit is really the leading industry event for um, heavy equipment distribution uh, networking. So it's a conference that we hold each year, typically in January, uh, which it will be next year in Orlando at a Disney property called the Coronado Springs Resort. We'll have 700 plus distributor attendees at this event representing a little over half of our distributor member organizations in any given year. Uh, so 230 or so. It is an executive level audience. So you will have the owners, senior management, executive management from the dealership organizations in attendance. Um, that's why it's such a high level networking opportunity uh, for manufacturers that are looking to build distribution uh, in uh, the US and Canada. 
Um, the conference has a expo called Condex, which is Conference Dealer Expo. And in this expo, we'll have 150 plus manufacturers, service providers that are exhibiting to meet the executives, build relationships and build partnerships. The dealer executives come to Summit for many things, one of which is to find new manufacturer lines to start to build a relationship with and service providers to help their businesses on a day-to-day -day basis. So there is no better event uh, that, that in the marketplace in North America to meet and network with people to help you grow your distribution in the United States. The uh, working with distributors in North America um, can sometimes present some challenges. So we've developed some supporting material that we often will uh, recommend to companies that are looking at the marketplace to uh, help position you uh, with the best place possible to proceed. One of which is I want to mentioned already, which is our cost of doing business report. This is a comparative financial analysis of dealer financial information that they submit to us on an annual basis. So our dealer members will submit confidentially their information to our reporting uh, system. We roll this up into this report that will give uh, really a, a manufacturer a very good picture of what a typical distributor looks like from a wide variety of uh, financial KPIs. Uh, it will give you what a high performing dealer looks like. It will give you an idea of what a dealer looks like depending on their product mix. Are they heavily rental? Are they less heavy rental? What does that look like from a financial pers perspective? So as you're meeting with prospective distributors, you can kind of gauge uh, where they stand compared to what the average is or what you're particularly looking for to support your business. Uh, extremely useful report uh, is one of I mean, the US manufacturers are some of our largest purchasers of this report each year because it gives them a perspective of how the other manufacturers, distributors are doing. It doesn't give you detail on the, the each given distributor individually. It rolls up the numbers in aggregate so you can get, get a feel for what the market looks like. Another report that we published that's very useful for manufacturers looking to come to the United States in particular, and this is a US focused report, is the contracts report. Um, this basically has a lot of information regard, regarding uh, how to form a healthy contract between a distributor and a manufacturer, uh, how to maintain that relationship, uh, potentially how it's best to end that relationship if need be. And then in specifically the important regulatory issues, common law issues that are in each of the 50 states. So uh, all of the states, uh, nearly all of the states in uh, the US have distributor laws that have to be um, considered in a distributor agreement, uh, particularly since some of the distributors cross over state lines. There are a few states that don't have any distributor specific laws in place uh, based on our analysis and uh, review by uh, our legal team. But um, this is also a very useful report when you're starting to get to that contract stage to make sure that one, you're not violating anything that's on, in law, but also really to give you guidance on how to make it a successful and productive relationship. The uh, state distributor protection law goes into more detail on those state laws. This will actually break down uh, more than 70 statutes in 48 states uh, out of the 50 that uh, we have that are, um, um, have stat laws on the books for distributor manufacturer relations. Uh, another useful report, uh, definitely one that is, uh, should be looked at by any legal entity that you have, any legal expert in your organization as you're drafting contracts uh, for uh, forming relationships with a distributor uh, in the United States. And then lastly, the one of the other publications that uh, is, a, is uh, highly recommended, uh, not only to stay aware of what's going on in, in uh, the AED marketplaces, but also the best place to advertise your dealer's wanted message is our CED magazine, Construction Equipment Distribution Magazine. It is an executive level magazine. Uh, I believe we've got 80% of our subscribers to this magazine. It uh, is uh, our uh, heavy equipment executive uh, role people. Um, so we really have management strategy stories in here, best practices, some new product highlights, but not a lot. Um, member feature profile stories about who you are and what you do uh, to help introduce you to the marketplace. 
uh, and to potential people, and then update on legislation, regulatory, and other industry trends uh, articles there. Uh, so it is really the best place to do it. You see on the, the photo there uh, of uh, one particular manufacturer from Germany that was uh, making a presence in the U.S. market. Uh, we kind of put them on the cover, said they're coming to America, did a story on them. Uh, at, the, at that time, they had no presence in the United States. They now have an established uh, subsidiary here and uh, several distributors uh, uh, representing their product throughout their territories. So what are the expectations of a distributor in uh, the North America market? Um, you know, in general, and they will vary from dealer to dealer, but in general, what we try to uh, roll up and, and provide as education is really kind of three main areas that the distributor is gonna expect. Uh, first, regarding availability of equipment, uh, parts and service really drives their business from a margin standpoint and exclusive areas of responsibility. So. Out of the cost of doing business report, I did pull a couple of the metrics, by no means all of them, but um, average distributor inventory holding period actually has been trending down slightly uh, to no great surprise due to the shortage of iron. Right now, you would expect an, a distributor on average to have that inventory for just about 240 days. Uh, average sales to inventory ratio is 1.8. That's relatively been maintained flat and turnover trending slightly up uh, at 2.2. So if you kind of look at those numbers, it gives you kind of a sense of what you might expect when you step into a deal organization as to what they're gonna typically have uh, and what you might be able to expect in a business relationship with them. Um, parts and service, the average gross margin on parts uh, is about 28% on average. Uh, that has trended down slightly uh, over the past couple of years and gross margin on service uh, also trending down slightly as well, but is at 55.9%. Uh, as you can see, these are big percentages of and big contributors to their business. Um, you can compare it to the gross average margin on machine sales of 12.6, which is also trending down. Um, in general, I think service labor costs are going up. Uh, parts costs are obviously going up a little bit, which is affecting some of the, the gross margin there. Um, it, based on the, what I can see from the trends of the cost of business report. Um, last, the last area, and I'll, I'll ask um, you know, my colleagues here to add any more commentary on it. Territory is really kind of the key term that our distributors look for. There are independent distributors in the marketplace. Um, they're no, normally not going to be stocking parts, stocking inventory, uh, not ones that are going to take any type of market share uh, requirements from you. Our dealers, our dealer members uh, really look for that exclusive area of responsibility, that they are responsible to, they have authority to sell the products in, have responsibility for, and end up taking the responsibility for market share uh, requirements in that. So this one area may be the primary thing that a lot of uh, distributors will look at when first considering whether uh, it's a product that they can, uh, that they're willing to take on. Uh, taking on a product line is, is not taken lightly by most distributors in the marketplace. Uh, there's a lot of training, a lot of uh, inventory and parts that they're willing to put in place to do it. So they definitely take their time, but they're definitely interested. Any co further comments? John, I would just ask, why don't you just take 30 seconds, explain to them some of the things you do for manufacturers who are looking for distributors when they participate at Summit? Yeah. So what we do at Summit, uh, when you guys, uh, if you're looking for distributors, uh, as we said, a lot of what we do is within CED, it's the dealer's wanted message. We take that and we translate that into the, the annual conference at Summit. So what we do at Summit is we highlight any manufacturers and multiple ways at the event uh, that have a dealer's wanted message. Uh, one of the unique things about our conference, which you may not get with trade shows per se, is you're gonna get a registered attendee list of who's coming to the event if you're an exhibitor. Uh, with that list, uh, together with myself, uh, if there are dealers that you wanna identify as potential that you'd like to meet with, uh, we work together to make sure we try to facilitate getting you together at those events. Uh, at Summit, have them come visit you in your booth. Uh, we've done things such as uh, mailings on behalf of the exhibitors to draw attention to who you are and what you do at the annual conference to help facilitate that connection that you're looking for 
uh, at the end of conference. So we get probably a little bit more involved than uh, showing up at a trade show with a booth and hoping they come by and talk to you. So the last uh, other area of uh, making use of associations uh, like AED. Um, so in general, I think we've covered a little bit on what distributors use AED for. Um, you know, they, we really try to serve them and gaining insight on improving their businesses, um, give them industry specific education for their employees. So we are really their go-to resource to educate and develop their department managers. Uh, as mentioned with AED Summit in particular, as well as our publication, finding new OEMs for distribution and meeting with their OEM suppliers that they already have relationships with also at the AED, uh, AED Summit. Manufacturers make use of associations uh, to grow their distribution in North America through all these various ways that we've talked about, utilizing our reports, uh, utilizing our events to make connections, strengthen the relationships with existing distribution, gain insight to the trends through things like the cost doing business report and hold uh, North American OEM distributor meetings at our annual conference. Um, there really is uh, the manufacturers that have come here, particularly from overseas, uh, particularly from Europe and the UK have found the uh, environment that we can create through AED at our events and the interest level of distributors in North America is quite high uh, to, to continue to grow their businesses. Uh, in many cases, the product lines they represent today, um, they're kind of boxed in. Uh, they have, you know, their product lines are offered by a neighboring distributor already, so they can't expand in that territory. But offering new product lines allows them to broaden their reach into new marketplaces and even new markets themselves. If it brings them into a, a new niche market within their marketplace, so if they're in uh, earth moving and road building, if it can introduce them into another another marketplace where they can uh, they can grow their business, uh, that is really what AD dealer, distributor members are are specifically looking for. That's about what we had to present today. If there's any other information, I want to keep uh, aware of the, uh, the power hour and leave a little bit of time for questions. Joanna, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, that was that was great. That was exactly what I was hoping you would cover. Um, there's one or two questions coming in um, in the chat box. First one is um, any reason that you're having the summit at parallel times to Wilder Concrete? <laughs> uh, well. <laughs> we wish we wouldn't. Um, we publish our schedule about three or four years out in advance. And uh, in our world, we, uh, we book these contracts for these hotels about five years out. So our date was established about five years ago for Summit, uh, maybe four years ago. Uh, I do coordinate with as many associations and other organizations I can if we don't book on top of each other. Unfortunately, uh, next year, World of Concrete moved their dates up a little bit earlier than what they normally have been. Uh, traditionally, past few years, they've been the week after us or two weeks after. So it wasn't an intentional. Um, and I think it just has the, the quirk of the calendar this, this coming year. So. Yeah, okay. Um... And I, will tell, I will add that um, the audiences are clearly different between the two. Con sure. World of Concrete, which I've been at many times, you're going to get the concrete contractors there and users, yeah. and users. You're going to get the users at that event. And it's really, mm -hmm. it is the event in the industry for concrete related users to attend to see what's new. Um, yeah. Again, our event being more of a, a business to business networking conference, not a user conference. Um, you're going to get the, the executive. So what, what happens a lot is the, the distributors really don't attend those kind of events as much. Um, the manufacturers, uh, if you're in both markets, you know, if you're looking at AED Summit and at World of Concrete, some that do both kind of split. Um, because our conference is more of an executive conference, executive management comes to ours. The product sales, product support people are at, at the uh, at World of Concrete because that's the types of people that come in. Those are the questions they're going to want to have. Uh, ultimately, the people at World of Concrete are going to buy those products through a distributor. Um, oh. Okay, that's good. Um... This is one from in English. Uh, what's the usual business model um, if you want to have a distributor in Canada and the US? Um, would they cross the 
international borders selling into the other territory or would you normally have a one dealer in in Canada and one in the States? Typically uh, it's the latter. We do have some cross-border uh, ownership, not a lot. Um, it depends uh, on the climate, uh, like you said, the economy and, and of course uh, trade policies, currency uh, exchanges. Uh, so for the most part, they would have a U.S. Uh, distribution and they would have Canada distribution is the majority of the month. Mm -hmm. would, would some of the, um, and what would the protocol be if you were um, a U.S. distributor up near the border and somebody just wanted to buy one machine from you in Canada, would that be allowed or would that be frowned on if there was already a dealer in, in Canada? Um, typically, they, they, you know, they watch, um, they do have market areas assigned. Um, and mostly that is um, uh, restricted to new. Used can kind of go anywhere, rental, um, uh, rental pretty much within, within the marketing area. But if it's on used, it's probably on the internet and that can come from anywhere. So no borders okay. on use, that kind of thing. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm gonna read this one out. Uh, Kevin Jin from Machine Max. Can you make a recommendation on participation to AED being a small telematic solution platform company? So I think he's, he's essentially saying, how, how can you help him? On, on telematics? Yeah, a small telematic solution platform company. So they are, a, if I understand correctly, uh, the individual asking the question is a telematics company looking to to engage um, in our- like, with, so, with yourselves, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's been a topic that we've discussed at nearly every meeting for at least right. the past seven years, telematics. Um, there are some, the larger manufacturers obviously have some telematics solutions there. They're rolling out with their equipment. And that's really kind of the large, uh, I would call them the household brand names. Um, but there are a lot of, there are a lot of smaller telematics companies we do work with that are even domestically based. Not a lot, but you know, there's a handful. Um, they find, I think they, they work in, uh, particularly in with dealers that have uh, mixed fleets specifically. Uh, where they uh, need a solution that can go across all the different fleet equipment, particularly in the rental side, uh, where we've seen probably the most success of working with a dealer to kind of put a telematic solution into their, say, the rental fleet um, as they're utilizing the equipment. Because in some cases, the distributors are doing quite a bit in rental and having those telematics uh, diagnostics has really helped them significantly in improving their service and support uh, on the rental side of their business. Um, short of their, their their new product business for maybe a larger line. So. Okay, well, Kevin, Kevin's come back and says, we target off-highway equipment agnostic to OEM platforms with mixed fleets. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yep. There are there are companies that, that they can do. They, they're not just strictly OEM related. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. And I think there's, so, yeah, yeah. I, I say there's um, the distributors that are multi-line and, uh, Probably a little bit more rental focused would be would be good targets. Which uh, mm -hmm. you know the the multi line dealers are actually our vast majority of the AED members, uh, just in sheer quantity. So if you look at four hundred fifty members, if you rule out what we kind of consider the the full line guys, so the the cat and the deers of the world, where that's almost all they sell, um, you still have three hundred plus distributors that sell a little bit of everything. Um, mm -hmm. So it seems like Kevin needs to get in touch with you then and get some Absolutely, information. Right. Okay, cool. Uh, one from Giuseppe says, can we say, as I think, that being part of AD is for a manufacturer of demolition attachments the best choice when entering the North American market or are there better suited associations? We promote demolition and are about to make this step. Um, we need to make this decision so she's saying can you help if them she's making demolition attachments would your uh, members be able to represent her yeah of course i think that the demolition market um i didn't have that as kind of one of the market segments it's really kind of uh, it is an interesting segment of its own i know that the scrap prices vary 
uh, can vary quite significantly from different areas of the country and actually vary from times of the year. Um, we do, our distributors are selling equipment where demolition attachments are, um, and scrap attachments are quite frequently used. Um, you know, the, the, there, there's, uh, when it comes to the, the attachments themselves, um, it's not as usually as specific when it comes to territorial uh, type things. And I think a lot of our distributors are usually selling it as uh, add-ons to the equipment that they're right. selling. So if they're selling an excavator um, and the, their customer needs a, uh, a demolition attachment with it, uh, they kind of couple those together. Uh, mm -hmm. they're not, there aren't that many distributors that purely just distribute attachments. There are a few that I'm aware of. Uh, but in general, those aren't ones that we are typically involved with. Uh, our guys are selling the whole goods with the attachments as an add-on. So uh, definitely can take that discussion offline with that uh, person and uh, be happy to okay. talk to you. Um, so just, just to people that are asking, um, uh, John and his colleagues are, are very happy to take any questions offline and uh, we'll send their contact emails around when we send out the, the slides. So the, you know, John's so happy to, to take up anything. I've uh, got a question from Martin Richards. Uh, can you elaborate on the reasons for increase in rentals shown in one of the earlier slides? And do you see this trend continuing? I think so. I, I don't think there's any doubt about it. Um, uh, at one point in time before the, the uh, pandemic, uh, rentals uh, we're taking um, uh, over 50% of the production or close to 50% of the production. Uh, that will, seems like it's a continuing trend, especially if we have United, Sunbelt, uh, some of these very, very large now. And don't get me wrong, it, it, it seems to be kind of not a lot of middle. So you're, you're very big as even, you know, a giants like United or Sunbelt, or they're very small uh, local uh, regional, uh, which are also popular and do very well. So we see rentals as increasing. We all of our rental webinars are sold out. Uh, we uh, uh, anytime we write uh, our rental um, uh, book uh, on the um, uh, the status of the rental organization, we always uh, have several uh, publications um, uh, added because it's just a very popular um, model. And really, if you're going to be in this business. There are some holdouts and I don't know how they do it because if you're gonna be in the construction equipment distribution business, you're gonna to have to have a rental fleet. And I think the customers are, uh, depending upon the, the uh, you know, economic climate, the political climate, uh, there's not always that confidence there. So they're not always going out and buying something. They'll rent it and then send it back and see how the, the um, uh, economy goes to a point where they may want to go ahead and, and purchase. So you have rent to rent, you have rent to sell markets, uh, really, you know, any flavor you want. But we see rental as continuing uh, very strongly. In the community. And I would add to that, um, kind of what touched on there with the consumer buying behavior has changed. Uh, and I think it's, to me, it's a little bit of two things. It's kind of that we've called it here within some of our articles, the Uberization effect of, of, uh, of the industry where people just want to use it when they need it and then turn it in when they're done with it. Um, and that's a little bit more of a buying behavior, whether that's economic driven, that they don't have the capital uh, to be able to purchase uh, or they're, and the other, I think side of it is the uncertainty about the next job, uh, which has been sustaining. Now, if we get an infrastructure bill, maybe that gives them some, some confidence on that. You know, they can buy a $250,000 piece of equipment and the next job will be there when they're done using it versus renting it for you know, a few months as needed for the project and then having to uh, have it sit there on their yard and pay for it without the next job. So I think it's a lot of different factors. Um, the, you know, the story at the end of the day is our distributors are not sales only. They kind of view the rental as the fourth pillar of their business now being sales, parts, service, and now rental. Um, so much so to the effect that last year we did publish for the first time a rental companion report to the cost doing business and an analysis report about how best to uh, in the rent in the as you're equip if you're an equipment distributor how should you structure your rental business how should you account for it because the accounting structures were different um, some people were all of them was kind of doing a little bit different where they were counting things 
from a financial perspective. Depreciation. Depreciation was different. So we kind of put together kind of our best practices guidelines for distributors so they can manage it uh, as we found to be the best practices in the industry. So uh, we say it's here to stay, but as you see, it's not, there's majority of their business is still sales, uh, but it's still, if you're not in the rental now, they're definitely losing out on some business. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we've been kind of educating our dealers on. Hey, here's how to get ready for it. Here's what you need to do. Here's the, the, the business processes that are different. Uh, and here's how the accounting processes are different. Yeah. Um, going back to the you know, uh, trillion dollar infrastructure bill that's going through, um, in the UK, we've got uh, a few mega, mega infrastructure improvement projects that have fairly strict um, environmental requirements attached to them, low carbon, net, you know, red to net zero, uh, percentage of equipment. And, I mean, what's the appetite for looking at future fuels and electric vehicles or moving on to hydrogen, do you think they'd write anything into that with, with contracts or would the contracts then go down to a state level to be awarded? Uh, and who who controls Cal that? Uh, other than California, <laughs> there, might be some, um, there might be some language there. We can ask uh, Daniel to chime in, but right now, of course, they have to be um, environmentally to, to the um, uh, current tier, which is tier four. Uh, mm -hmm. Europe typically leads us a little bit, as well as California. Um, and uh, when you're already at five and our five is, is coming on, uh, I think the, uh, there's certainly the electrification is out there as far as and even autonomous fleets. Uh, so the technology is out there. I don't think they're quite ready to dictate uh, hydrogen, we know the uh, several of the engine uh, manufacturers have the hydrogen cells and uh, are um, uh, teaming up. Uh, the diesel folks are teaming up with the hydrogen uh, cell technology, and uh, that looks to be a, uh, a bright future. Uh, they also have um, the uh, electric uh, trucks, mostly mobile on highway uh, at this point in time. So the technology is there, it's developing, it, it continues to be improved. I think the fossil fuels are going to be with us a long, long time. So it's, it's going to be difficult to, um, to dictate those into specs. But I think as the environmental climate continues to, to go toward, we'll call it green, uh, I think those technologies uh, will, uh, are uh, not only emerging, but are, are continuing and, and getting um, much more sophisticated and much more uh, not only reliable, durable, but economical. So there is certainly a transition, uh, but before I think we get too many dictates, like I said, other than maybe California notwithstanding, right. uh, I think we'll be in our, in following the uh, tiers and the next level uh, would be five. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think we're certainly in, in the UK, I'm, I'm seeing uh, articles about certain percentages of equipment on sites having to be, uh, no emissions, you know, much sooner than, than say 2030 or 2050. Um, I mean, there's some quite unrealistic numbers floating around. Dale, are you still there? You can probably elaborate a bit more on, on how strict our regulations yeah, sure. are going to be. Yeah, th thanks for that, Joanna. Yeah, as you already mentioned, guys, we, we have stage five and have done for a couple of years now in, uh, in, in, in Europe of, I speak Europe globally. Uh, and the UK, of course, uh, sort of joining as, as one there. Um, and um, we're not likely to see uh, stage six uh, until towards the end of this decade, at which point, of course, you wonder, will manufacturers even start to invest in a stage six engine if, if, if the future of uh, certainly some um, engine types, maybe the smaller diesels, are, uh, you know, have a limited lifespan. Um, so we, wa we watch the regulatory front with interest, I mean, as we always do. But what's interesting in this regard um, is we're finding the forces are more market driven um, than pure regulation driven. Um, it's, uh, it's to suit the, um, the credentials, the environmental credentials of the contractor or of the local authority um, who are requiring um, a, uh, a machinery to be of a certain requirement, uh, which may be over and above the minimum legal requirements. So it's a very, very dynamic uh, situation at the moment. Um, and. Um, 
I mean, there's no, uh, there's no silver bullet to this. There's no, um, the, 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 there's no one size fits all um, solution. Um, hydrogen will have a role to play, um, both as a fuel in reciprocating engines uh, and as a, um, a longer term for, for fuel cells. Um, uh, and uh, biodiesel uh, will uh, will have a role uh, to play, and diesel itself, fossil diesel, will, will continue to have a role to play, as was mentioned for many years. So it's very dynamic at the moment. There are no um, signs of any legal uh, changes uh, on the on the on the near horizon. But uh, it uh, you know obviously the situation will uh, will change quite rapidly. I think as uh, as regulations catch up with with with, with new developments. Yeah, it's it's as Dale knows, he spends a lot of time trying to uh, explain to governments how some of their aspirations are somewhat virtue signalling and, and are not necessarily going to appear in reality. Um, nice though they may be, and I, I constantly get bombarded with um, government questionnaires about what percentage of your fleet um, is going to be electric, uh, but they don't quite seem to understand that it's not like driving a car. Uh, so it sounds like in Washington, um, the appetite's not quite there uh, as it would be in California for um, reducing I think, carbon. Um, I think the appetite is there among certain uh, political sides. <laughs> There's not, uh, but there is not the uh, the majority there to enact sweeping environmental, um, you know, initiatives right now. Um, so the you know the infrastructure bill that hopefully we have out. Really, that what that does is the federal government gives that money then, and I think this was mentioned to the states, the localities, and they really kind of dictate um, the situation. But we're, I mean, the infrastructure bill does have a lot of money for electrical infrastructure to start moving to electric vehicles, to start moving to you know more electric. But I mean, I, we have a significant problems with our electrical grid in this country as well. So I don't even think our the grid can handle a mass electri electrification right now in the United States. Um, so I think we're still a number of, um, as Bob said, I agree with everything Bob said, we're still a number of years off there. And I have not heard of any mandates on us, particularly on the equipment side of things. Um, you know, the federal government is now just now starting to think about investing in full fleets of cars that are electric. So I think the equipment side is going to be, you know, sure at some point, but I don't, I don't see that happening any time you, you don't have that infrastructure. They're going to have to have really long extension cords uh, to keep it powered <laughs> up. But we just don't have that infrastructure in place to stop over and, and recharge. Yeah. Yeah. So if anyone wants to sell really long extension cords, I think there's a right. great <laughs> there <in> the <laughs> that's, a, that's an opportunity. Yes. Okay. Uh, can't see any more questions. That, that's been actually really, really useful, guys. And I think we can yeah, really hook up after this. I can, I've can. i just written down, um, we're going to be like the, uh, the Tinder app for construction equipment. I'm told on my Google that you do have Tinder in America, so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, but it would be great if we, you know, if our members can just hook up with you and your members and vice versa. If any of your people are looking for specific products, then we can put you in touch with people. Um, we both run uh, trade events. You've got Condex, you're more conference driven. Uh, we've got our plant works exhibition, which is actually going to be in 23. Um, and we'd be very happy about talking to you, uh, you know, about being able to attend each other's events and okay. you know, possibly Great. bringing trade delegations over. So, um, Very good. Yeah, yeah thank you so, for the time. We appreciate the, uh, the uh, opportunity to address your, your members and uh, look forward to any way we can help uh, going forward as things return to normal. And we, yeah, and we yeah, promise to be, to be a uh, uh, kind host to your um, uh, Ryder Cup teams and good luck to them. <laughs> I'm sure you're gonna be great hosts. Um, just before we wrap up, uh, oh, uh, let's go to the end. We're going to uh, just do a quick advert for the next Power Out, which is on the 20th of October, and that will be Dale uh, Campbell, who you've heard speaking, who's the CEO's chief technical consultant. And uh, Dale is looking at something we, we touched on earlier, is uh, 
UK and the EU after Brexit and uh, how's that going? So Dell's doing a seminar uh, with the, our European friends of the Trade Association and uh, is going to follow that up with, I guess he's gonna struggle getting all this in an hour, but uh, he's going to give it a good go. So thanks very much everybody for attending today and uh, see you all again in October. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, folks. Goodbye.